This is your theory video for the Refraction and Snell's Law lab. This diagram here shows you the basics of how we deal with refraction. The blue line indicates the boundary between two different optical materials. Um, N1 is the index of refraction where the incident ray lives, and N2 is the index of refraction of the material that the ray is going to go into. In this particular case, the index of refraction um, N1 is less than N2. Um, I've also drawn the surface normal, this thin red line. It is normal or perpendicular to this blue interface, and it is the line that we measure all of our angles with respect to. So for instance, this ray is coming in, it is incident on the interface, and so we designate the angle it makes from the surface normal as theta 1 call that our incident angle. This is our incident ray. Then our refracted ray lives in material N2 and because of this condition where N2 is greater than N1 or N1 is less than N2, we will always see that the ray will refract toward the normal. So if this is its incident direction, then it refracts to the normal making a smaller um, angle with respect to the surface normal theta 2 than theta 1, right? So I can even say if n1 is less than n2, then I know theta 2 will be smaller than theta 1. This is what we expect when we go from a low index of refraction material into a higher index. We refract toward the normal. Now that all comes out from Snell's law, um, which I won't prove, but Snell's law relates the indices of refraction to the sign of the incident and refracted angles. As you'll see in the procedure video for this lab, you're effectively going to be changing the incident ray angle. You'll be starting off at normal at zero degrees and you'll in keep increasing this angle by about five degrees until you get somewhere around 80 degrees or so. It gets very difficult at that point to collect good data, but up to 80 degrees hopefully. And what you'll then be doing is measuring the corresponding refracted angle with respect to the surface normal from it. In the end though, we want to experimentally determine the index of refraction N2. It is an unknown. And the way we're going to do it is not by looking at one particular angle, um, one set of angles, incident and refracting angles. We're going to find N2 um, by graphing. And we're going to use the slope of that graph to determine our index of refraction N2. We do it this way because each data point, there's going to be some error associated with it. So if we average over all the data points, which is effectively what a line of best fit does, then we'll be able to get a much more accurate value for your index of refraction N2. And essentially what we do is we assume, and we'll, I'll do this at the end, but assume N1 is air. And to a high degree of accuracy, four significant digits, it's one. So that makes it easy for us. But the idea is you have incident angles from zero to about 80 degrees every five degrees if possible and you'll be collecting and writing down the values for your refracted angles. So the idea here is, is if I divide both sides of Snell's law by n1 and again we know it's going to be equal to one but in general it will look like this. Right, so we're going to graph sine theta 1 on the vertical axis, the y-axis, so that'll be our y-value, and we'll have sine of theta 2 on the horizontal axis. or our x-axis. And so if I do that, 
then what I'll get is a line with slope equal to n2 over n1. So whatever slope you get from your line of best fit, a number, that's equal to n2 over n1, which is pretty much equal to n2 since n1 is, to a good degree of accuracy, just 1. Okay, so that's the first way in which you're going to, and the most accurate way in which you're going to calculate the index of refraction of the unknown n2, be it a piece of glass or plexiglass or possibly water. Um, so that's the first part of the lab. The second part of the lab concerns total internal reflection. And so what happens here is now what you do is re you reverse everything. And I haven't changed the numbers, but I have changed the overall effect. When you flip the experimental um, semicircular piece of material around, and the light initially goes through the circular interface and then hits the flat interface. That flat interface will be between being in a material and I think I have this wrong. Um, this is incorrect here. N1 is greater than N2 in this case. So now you flipped everything around and the incident ray is in the unknown material and the exiting ray is refracting out into air. When you do that, all of the sudden now, your refracted angle ends up being larger than your incident angle. And the idea here is, is as we keep increasing this refracted angle, excuse me, this incident angle, the refracted angle will eventually bend to be just along the interface itself, right? And so we call that total internal reflection when, and of course, your incident material is a greater index than your refracted material. That's our given. But when theta 2 goes to about 90 degrees, and what you'll see is a reflected beam or a reflected ray in N1 will get very bright. See the procedure video for an example. When you're right at the condition of total internal reflection, your refracted angle is now 90 degrees. Your incident angle is less than 90 degrees because incident will always be smaller than refracted in this situation where you're in the high index material going to the low index material. Um, so in that case, then we have what's called total internal reflection. And the value of the incident angle at that k in this situation when that happens um, is called the critical angle for total internal reflection. So if I go ahead and apply this to, to Snell's law, well, I have n1 sine of theta 1 equals n2 sine of theta 2. But now, theta 1, in this condition, theta 2 is 90 degrees. Remember, we'll write it down, n1 sine of the critical ang angle of incidence is equal to n2 times sine of 90 degrees. That's our condition. But you'll see it best when the reflected ray in N1 gets very bright. It's always going to be there, but it really shows itself when you get to that just point of total internal reflection, just when the refracted angle is 90 degrees. Now look it up, but sine of 90 degrees is 1. So that makes things a lot easier. And so we have N1 sine of theta 1 
excuse me, sine of the critical angle is equal to N2. So once you measure your critical angle, the angle in the high index material that causes to the reflected beam to get bright, but coincidentally theta 2 becoming 90 degrees, and you'll see it approaching that, but as soon as it gets there, boom, you'll see the reflected angle. Well, then you can determine the value of N2 directly from the sine of the critical angle. If N1 equals 1, then you're all set. Um, that basically concludes the theory video. Look at the procedure video to see how it's done. Look at the experiment file. There are pictures that show you um, what your experiment should look like.